Welcome back, everybody, to Lit versus Genre. I am Steve. And I'm Jeff. And uh, now we are here at the inn, uh, Dragon Fang symbol once again, because apparently there's some there's some white cloak fools running all around, putting <laughs> Dragon Fangs on people's doors and all this nonsense. Look at that connection you just got. I know. I'm, 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 I'm getting so good at this now, Jeff. Are you proud of me? I, I am actually very, very proud. I was not expecting you to come out with that. I'm super, super excited that you did. Cool. Um, it's great. It's great. Almost as excited as I was when the innkeeper said, welcome to Marilyn in the last chapter. And I felt that warm glow all around me as I then began this chapter about the stack of mine. But yeah, so I love that you noticed the dragon fang. That's awesome. Let me look back at that. Yeah, welcome. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a good little chapter ending hit right here, because yeah. you're like, I'm going to get to see something new. I'm going to yep. get to see an exactly. inn. An inn that is you. even bigger than our <laughs> wine spring inn. Oh, my goodness, everything's so the big. The parents is true. <laughs> parents is true. Parents like, no, no. Yeah, it's like, come on, Matt. But I love that I make fun of about the Coplin. I didn't know we brought a Coplin with us. <laughs> right, <laughs> I know. Well, I, didn't, smack. I didn't really necessarily get that. Are they saying like Copland would would be always sticking up for two rivers all the time and saying like we're the best? Is See, that kind of what he yeah. means there? Well, so here's the thing. I feel like this is one I just kind of give. <laughs> to, okay. to Robert Frank. And what I mean by that is like I think with the Copland thing is brought up to mean a liar. I think in this case, right? Ah. But yeah, it's more like Perrin is lying to be true to his hometown right right whereas ones are really complainers about everything and troublemakers right so it's like how does it i mean i love it because it's like it's an inside joke with these like two rivers kids right um but does it perfectly align i think i think we can like sort of fit this in kind of um but yeah it's not quite it's not quite perfect sure when i read i was like i i don't completely get it but i don't feel like i need to get it right here mm -hmm. um it's just matt being an idiot and more and more i'm like matt's just an idiot wait what's our proof did we have proof earlier that he was just like an idiot i mean he did do the practical jokes but i, well, feel I thought like you got in this chapter with the uh <laughs> yeah right so i this was when it like really sealed for me that matt mm -hmm. and the gleeman they are a, a match made in heaven of absolute idiocy Love it. And I um, <laughs> don't know how um, I'm supposed to like <laughs> like this dude. Oh, uh, that's great. That's great. Okay. Uh, did you everybody trying to cover up for him though? Was that yeah? That was pretty. Yeah, that's pretty fun. E uh, even even idiot Tom is like, okay, I I get what's going on here, and so uh, we're gonna try and cover this up. Um, yep. Yeah. So let, let's recap. They kind of go in here. They split uh -huh. up. We get another, like, real minor mystery of here of who is Min. Yep. Uh, and I guess we see her later for, like, the briefest of seconds. Uh, I don't yep. actually know that's Min, um, but we see... Like, yeah, we have no idea. We see a random person, I'm assuming. It's it's Min or what have you. Um, but that's... Okay, whatever. There's another mystery. Um, then they split up and uh the the boys all take a bath and there's this like you know local who's talking to him and kind of asking him about mm -hmm. trouble or whatever right. and sure of course right. matt spills this thing about trollocs and everybody tries to shut him up uh but Rand says something about that he was like oh he was like the guy was about to tell us um mm -hmm. some information right. but then he didn't yeah because the guy asks is there trouble down country too? Right. Mm -hmm. um and then so that's why they're well one i thoroughly enjoy is like in the rivers or whatever it is you call it. yeah like, the the rivers. Rivers, son. The two rivers. <laughs> uh, we got two of show a little respect exactly exactly um but yeah and then so rand's like what do you mean too is there some kind of trouble here um, and that's right after the two rivers thing. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yeah, that's what that's what he's referring back to. Is like it seemed like the guy was going to tell us something, but then he didn't. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh. So that happens. Oh. That's all well and good. Um, then they like go to dinner. 
Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And oh, here's this girl that that then also shows up right. and then like immediately leaves. Uh, although, so her hair is cut short and she's wearing mm -hmm. a man shirt and trousers. Right. All right. Um, cool. <laughs> that's that's cool. I guess. Uh, Here is the difference between a long mystery and a clo a closed mystery, right? Or a question that is going to take a while to get answered versus one that's not, right? So, uh, like the Stone of Tears, we were talking about last chapter. Like, where where the heck is he? He is that thing, right? Whereas this girl is here, um, and we did also get uh, Moraine asked for men right before mm -hmm. that. Like we said, maybe this is men, maybe it's not. What, what does she do? And so this, I feel like, and obviously I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Is that narratives, whether they're mysteries or not, are full of questions that the readers want answers to, mm -hmm. and they're going to get some answers sooner and some answers later. And so I think you plant some seeds for the long game and you plant some seeds for the short game as a writer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we're, we're seeing, obviously, some seeds for the short game in this to keep us interested in the immediate while there's also these, like, bigger overarching things that we're waiting to pay off further out. Did you get a sense of that with this or was it just so, like, small and inconsequential? It was like, whatevs? Yeah, this is so minor that I, I don't even care about this, like, at all. I And I just assume... I'm going to find out immediately. I mean, that's kind of an interesting, mm -hmm. okay, uh, okay. an interesting uh, frame that you put around it, long game and short game. And I wonder if like, like something like this, would you agree that like, you have to answer it right away because you, you really don't have a reason to care. Like maybe that's really, again, coming back to my whole like stakes yeah. to the mystery. I got to know the stakes to the mystery. If I'm going to care, there's like literally zero stakes to this right. mystery it's so maybe the lower the stakes are the sooner you have to answer it Ooh. is that a possible thing uh, i don't know I, that i mean intuitively just about as you go with the gut react i mean i'm sure there's got to be exceptions right like, uh, after, you know with everything i'm so gun shy of being saying something all the time but yeah it does seem like that would make sense because otherwise we're going to question why are we even learning about girl or this right right like we're we're waiting so there's not a, a huge expectation right because as you said we don't have stakes we don't even care it's not like we learned before they got here that i'm going to be meeting with someone that can solve all of our problems and teleport us instantly to tarvalon right now we care about this individual um but this is just like almost an aside question um uh -huh. that we assume will get answered but i feel like those aside questions can build up and create momentum to a degree right right uh okay so she's there I, so uh, talking about things that i do care about though i feel like these moments are all just playing out like real quick and it's, mm -hmm. and it's also like so like immediately shut down like he starts having this thought about egg and then he's like wait you know egg is still egg this it's still this girl that i maybe like maybe don't like <laughs> maybe I, it's not her fault so i'm gonna apologize she stiffens and turns her back and that's enough for rand right there to be like screw her i'm not gonna talk to her anymore like, yep. can't do nothing about that <laughs> I'm like, what? You gave up on this already? It's just, it's yeah. kind of ridiculous to me. I'm like, come on, dude. What? You know, What's going I love on? It. Yeah, to me, I. Here, here's the thing, right? So, if you are reading, if your interest is more the relationship between mm -hmm. Rand and Egg, you're really not gonna, you're not getting that itch scratch that much so far, yeah. right? Um, which, which again, does, does lead to like, what are the questions that the reader cares about? You know, and. I actually, <laughs> I said I was going to work in it some way in this job. I didn't expect to do it now. But fascinating enough, um, Robert Jordan actually used to have some historical fiction that he would write underneath a pen name. Um, and he actually envisioned it as like a bodice ripper, like a, um, at least that's the, the phrasing that's used in the mm. Wikipedia article. Yeah. Uh, really like romantic, you know? So I find it interesting that he has written like romantic historical fiction, yeah? But he's choosing in this story to to not go that same direction. Like, obviously, there could be more screen time spent with these two. Right. It, it's, he knows that he's got to address it, as he does right here, right? Right. But it's so quick. It's so in and out. And, you know, I, I wish I could sit down with him and say, like, you know, what made you choose to, you know, yeah. not do as much with the romantic side of things on this as perhaps you've done in other works? I mean, I feel like he... he 
knows intuitively that mm -hmm. that's important. So right. he's not letting it drop here because there's no reason yeah. even for this little moment necessarily to have to happen right here. So like, you're right. Like he's doling it out, but he's doling it out like so in, in little drips and drabs. And I, right. I don't know. You tell me, I wonder if that's like, because the perceived fantasy audience in the nineties is mm. very different from the perceived fantasy audience now like now when i think of fantasy audience I, I think a lot of like about um that there's like mm -hmm. a big female readership and that like a, and, and oh, even yeah. the male readership too just want is more about that being the driving force of a narrative than maybe it was in the 90s when it was more people going just show me the swords and the action sort of thing you know, I, I wish I could say, but I, I think we definitely, well, I don't know, because I'm not thinking about like modern books I've read as well. Um, I think part of it is just what the writer wants to focus on, right? Mm -hmm. Do I want to focus on the more plot driven, dark one, escaping the dark one, or do I want to focus more on these characters and their thoughts and their relationship with each other? Because obviously, Again, there is so much more that could potentially be said about Rand obsessing with his feelings about her, mm -hmm. their little interactions and everything. It's just, you know, not getting shown. Um, so, yeah, I think part of it depends on the author. Part of it depends on um, if it's a... I, I think we see more of the relationship stuff in the YA fantasy that's come out, which obviously there's a massive uh, market for. Right. Um, but I, I think we do also see it in, um, you know, adult fantasy as well. Um, but I think, I think if I was to generalize, I think the YA has sort of embraced this more relationship and learning about these loves and love triangle, you know, all those things, not, not that they didn't exist before. Um, but so I, I think we're seeing some of that here. More, I was just interested in the idea that I, I haven't read the, this historical fiction of his, but I assume <laughs> that, you know, he was writing, uh, from a romantic angle, especially if you look at the cover of it, um, of this story and it's just fascinating to me the choice he's making and yeah is he making that choice because of his interest is is he more interested in writing sort of the journey um or is he writing it that way to sell because he thinks that's what readers will want more of. <laughs> uh yeah. you gotta read that jeff you gotta be a completist <laughs> it's, and, uh... yeah, it's called the it's called the fallen blood actually okay um and i know that i promised before to say how um robert jordan met his wife it's actually, I mean, this is again a Wikipedia article. Anyone can look it up. But the short, short version is that um, he sent her Warriors of Atai or Altai, which has now actually been unearthed and released. Um, but she rejected that. It was like, I don't want that. And so he sent her the historical fiction series that she started to do. And then after that, they started started dating. And then after that, he made Wheel of Time. So it was actually this. Uh, Warriors of Itai is his first one, and then the historical fiction series after that. But yeah, I suppose if I am a true uh, Robert Jordan fan, I should go back and read, uh, read all of He apparently did lots of things underneath pen names. Uh, maybe not tons, but, you know, some. Um, there's only, only so much time in the day, and I do love my fantasy. But I'll, I'll <laughs> see what I can do. Maybe at the beginning, I'll read them. All right. I am getting, I am getting worried this relationship is is not gonna pay off like i'm having trouble seeing like you know where they have to make a a definitive choice that i'm gonna be really mm -hmm. kind of crushed mm -hmm. by you know like how is this gonna crush right. me emotionally and like i'm starting to get to the point where i'm like i they're just not gonna get together and that's fine and i kind of don't care anymore whereas i want that to be like emotionally brutal you know mm -hmm. but i don't know mm -hmm. if it is gonna be and for some reason my feeling is is doubt that i'm going to be super emotionally sad um uh, when they don't get together but like i don't know maybe not maybe i'm wrong maybe something's gonna turn around here um so what would you be reading for if not that then what would i be reading for here at this point yeah, like if like uh, if you get that feeling right, and you're like, I don't know if this is gonna pan out because I'm barely, I'm just barely getting any of it, right? Right. And then so what? <laughs> right, it may, maybe nothing, right? But the fact that we're still making more of these recordings, but no, uh, <laughs> what is there anything that is 
listen to you beyond that relationship thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Would I be reading this on my own if it if it wasn't like we were doing this and like I wanted to like just learn more about the genre and like what mm-hmm. makes it tick? I like I don't know. I don't know, man. Uh, yeah. Like I'm not that invested in the mysteries right now. I, I'm not sure I know what the stakes are of it right now. And like, right. and, and it feels very like, yeah, the characters aren't making choices and we're just making a journey sort of thing. So right. I, I want something that like either like ups the stakes, maybe, you know, one of the, one of these kids dies or something. I don't know. Like something happens to like ramp the stakes up. Man, we talked about Lord of the Rings last time, but I think it is kind of a a brilliant thing to do to have one of the hobbits get taken um, at the end of that first movie. And apparently I did watch like, because I haven't read the books you have, of course, but that actually happens before the end of the first book. I Mm. I think... Mm. Um, not that I've read yeah. the books, but I think somebody was kind of saying yeah. how the books are different from the movies and that like in the movies, he, you know, obviously very smartly kind of made that like the cliffhanger of right. the movie, but then that doesn't really happen. It happens earlier in the first book. And I'm like, well, that certainly is a way to take like, okay, you have these stakes set, you have this journey, and now we've just upped the stakes on this in a big way. Um, so something like that, would right. get get me like more like whoa okay now what's gonna happen how are they gonna get that hobbit back right, right. So, whatever right so up the stakes of this if the journey is going to be the main thing right up the stakes of the journey and the dangers associated right, with it right no I, I was curious because you know uh I, I don't think this is a no it's definitely not a spoiler for me to say that you know this book is not regarded as the best book of the series um mm. uh, this is what some people regard as like Jordan finding his feed with right. fantasy like side of things. And Jordan like, you know, using a known structure that works, which is the story of the journey from Lord of the Rings, right? right. Um, and then really making it his own um, as we start getting into books two, book three, that sort of thing. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I, I'm also, because I, even though I've reread this series, there's so many books, right, for me to remember book one. I'm also interested to see how soon will we get some amp tension or, or will this just stretch? And is that why some people have trouble getting into the series because of book one? Hmm. Um, I also then wonder how much the new beginning that's got a Gwen is like trying to make that promise of like, do you like a Gwen? You're going to get more about a Gwen eventually. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, and you were also talking to me about, or, well, we did in the last video about how having these promises or questions that won't be fulfilled for books for you as a reader is like, oh, what? Yeah. I don't want to wait that long, right? And so is this then just appealing to people or mostly appealing to people who are okay to wait, right? Or okay to wait books until they get a bigger payoff. So yeah, mm. I'm, a, I'm actually like way more pumped. I was already pumped, but way more pumped to read the next chapter to see like how soon do we get tension added to any part of this, the journey, the relationship, anything at all. Okay, Jeff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot. You do ready? it. Do it. What is the best book in the series? I can't. I can't even. I can't even. Pick one. <laughs> can, you, can you narrow it down? Can you narrow it down? No, because no, it would be getting into too many spoilers. <laughs> you, know, like, you just need just, to say a number. You just—that's all you need to do. Say a number right now, coward. Okay. Do it. Here's, here's, here's what I'm going to say. Here's what I'm going to say. Um, I remember thinking that one of my favorites was uh, Robert Jordan's last one, the mm-hmm. last one he did. Oh. Because there's, there's a book that's considered kind of a, 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 different people disagree on like where exactly it is, but the people that read the whole series, many comment that there's a slog, kind of like late midpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of felt that too, because there's a book that takes place over just like a couple of days and mm-hmm. it's still the same size, you wow. know, and there's not a lot that happens. Right. Um, and then the book after that, I just felt, I, it's so vivid in my mind. I remember feeling like, yeah, he's back. He's in it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I felt like Robert Jordan just like hit the ground running. Um, and I was just 
thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy that series. And obviously, uh, that that book in the series, obviously, then then devastated after you know he yeah. was gone, um, and you know very personally happy that it, it got closed out the way that it did uh, in what I think is an effective way. Um, but yeah, that if, if I was to just answer off the cuff, like that reading experience for me really stood out of one that was kind of a bit of a slog. And then the next one just had me back in, had me excited for these characters. Right on. But there's so many moments throughout this series that honestly, a lot of the middle books just blend together to me um, because there's so many of them, right. you know, I, for me to distinguish what happened in like book four versus book five, I'd have to go back and look at the titles and the summaries to really say, but I, but I know for sure the last book that Jordan wrote, I really love that book. Right on, right on. Do you feel like that's also like a, a phenomenon? Because I've heard like a similar, the the like slog book, I've heard that like mm-hmm. leveled at uh, one of the Game of Thrones books too, or maybe even like two of them where people are like, this one was just like, too oh, long yeah. went off mm-hmm. on too many mm-hmm. random characters that i hadn't That's... heard about before and i mm-hmm. mean is that like something that like is endemic of these a little bit that like it seems like at a certain point the author's gonna hit that and has to like work through it i mean it, it could be just from an author's standpoint i i look forward to being able to answer that question better in you know, <laughs> 10 years i've written my 10 book series right, or yeah. whatever but what I, what I will say, and it's interesting asking that question because of what we were just talking about with Lord of the Rings and where it cuts off, um, you may or may not know, relatively know the fact that Lord of the Rings was uh, one book, right. but the editors didn't publish something that was that big and so broke it into a trilogy, right? right? And I do wonder if Tolkien had been writing it from the beginning, if he would have like had the breaks be at different points than, they, than I'm assuming right. he and the ended up choosing after he had written the whole novel right. and just like how it affected things, right? Um, but... I'm bringing that up because just to say that editing, like um, editing and publishing, has an impact on this. Because, for example, in Game of Thrones, um, a book that a lot of people are like, "Wait, what now?" was Feast for Crows because we only got to see basically half the characters. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the characters that we had loved and been waiting to read about, right, is Z. And so it's like, um, excuse me, <laughs> like I've been waiting so long, and there's this book where my my favorite character is not in it. Um, and so that's the problem with the story growing in the telling um, as, you know, uh, I, I want to say Robert Jordan is the one that said that. Maybe it was George R. Martin, but I think it was Jordan. But anyway, the idea that with these big fantasy books that they, they can grow sometimes beyond a point of recognition or beyond the point that they should. Yeah. Um, but And I think that's what I got so excited with Robert Jordan that I felt like he did return to form with, um, pardon me, that book after it and kind of started to bring things together. Um, whereas I think <laughs> I, I don't want to speak her one, but I'm certainly waiting for George R. R. Martin to accomplish the yeah, same thing. All right, right. Come on, George. All right. Uh, that's <laughs> that's also interesting. That idea. I, I wonder how how often like these kind of these things pass into folklore. Like, do you know? Mm. Do like Tolkien really just have the whole thing and right, then just exactly. straight split it? Because that sounds really weird to me. Because the second book. Uh, sounds wild to me because apparently like it's just the second book is literally just split in two unlike the movies where you just follow uh, the uh, Frodo and uh, Sam and uh, Mm -hmm. that uh, idiot Gollum and you just follow them and like he doesn't intercut back and forth like the movie does it's like literally you just follow them to like kind of the end point of that movie and then you double back it goes like back in time and then you yeah. follow the mm-hmm. other characters for their part of it and i was like that sounds like such a structural change that right. it would be wild to put that in the middle of your book right like if you're like this is going to be one book to do that in the middle it feels like something like once they told him split it into three then i see you kind of going oh well this will let me do this kind of fun thing with the second book and so like it really does change like sure like maybe he had the whole thing but he probably like kind of kept you know adding to it or or changing it when they made him split it up in the same way that like lucas always says like oh i knew like the whole story i had the whole three star wars movies written it's like no you didn't dude because you were clearly just making it up as you went along like you're you're just lying (laughs) you're just burnishing or maybe not lying but you didn't know exactly what was going to happen and once you decided to split it up you 
you added to it and it grew in the telling as you said right. i feel like rabbit holes and rabbit holes with right, this one right. um but, but all stuff i i am totally fascinated by i don't hopefully our, our listeners are too um i would say I, I would love to know i mean i should probably do more uh digging about that folklore right associated with he had a book and they just took a cleaver to it right and into three parts right like obviously i'm sure there was more going on than that i'm sure he had a hand in it i'm sure they moved stuff shuffled stuff i would imagine right, right. um but i don't know but i but i would be fascinated uh to to find out more so maybe, maybe somebody in the comments will do or maybe like i researched uh robert Jordan's relationship uh with his wonderful wife i can do the same yeah uh, so we'll see with harriet Right. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, look, I'll actually, I'll look that up. I'll look that up about three books because oh, I'm, yeah. I'm curious about that. Yeah, that'll for be this, fun trivia. Uh, for this one, I know that Robert Jordan was contracted to write way fewer books. Ah. Like, I don't know the exact number. It was going to be done in like, I think he said it was going to be done in three books or so. Oh, that's and his editor was like, let's do five. And he was like, okay. <laughs> and then it's like more than twice that, right? Wow. And it's like, the editor was like, I thought I had it. I thought I was predicting enough in advance and i did not i did wow. not account for how much the story would grow um i'm gonna look i want to find those numbers but yeah that's that's something that is also interesting to consider that when he was writing this book he was thinking right. uh that the series would be a fraction of the size that it ended up being like imagine alternate history where i don't know it doesn't do as well and they don't tell them right keep writing more right? and like do you like, know was it was it the was it when he got to the third one they're like please write more and so then he was like well okay i'll stretch it out or did he get to the third book and go like look sorry guys i'm uh, not gonna be able to end this right here i read them i'm gonna definitely go with option b because there's no right. way the book feels anywhere close to finish. right right <laughs> it's okay. like there's still so much left to take you know into account so yeah i think it was definitely that you know hey, i'm writing a book i'm writing more books i'm writing more books oh guys we're not done <laughs> like, right i got it <laughs> all right well speaking of so much more to talk about let's uh move on here and talk about two i think there's really only two more things to talk about with this chapter to be honest one is we're sticking around in the city for another day Ooh, ooh. this does not seem wise to me this does not <laughs> this seems <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah yeah i dig it because i can foresee that something is going to go wrong here but i sort of don't really get what Moraine is, is thinking about <laughs> especially when everybody's like openly excited like the kids are like oh we get a day in the city and i'm like no moraine you know that's not gonna go well Idiot Matt almost just told this other dude this thing like two seconds ago, literally two seconds ago. Yeah. So not not really sensical there for them to do, but all right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think again that we get into like what makes sense versus what's just fun, <laughs> right. right? Like, does it make a lot of sense for them to stay another day? I mean, and, and the, it feels like there could have been reasons given, right? right. Like the white cloaks are patrolling the road out uh, for mm -hmm. the next day or something, right. or I've got contacts I need to spend the next day talking with or something like that. Right. And maybe Moraine has all those reasons, right? We're certainly not given them. But here I do feel like we okay it because we're like, I want to see this. <laughs> like, yes, right. let him loose in a city. And I think that obviously Jordan knows that, especially when he literally has Tom say that, right? Yeah. Like these country folk loose in a, in a, in a city. Right, right. Yeah. Signposting. He's joking with them about like, it's it's funny because it says a uh, uh, city. So is he again making fun that Bearlon's not really a city, mm -hmm. which he did do earlier? Right. Is he also making fun of the idea of them being loose in it? Right. Or is he just doing about ah, some interesting, like multiple layers to that. Right. Okay, so they break up into their separate rooms. Rand's bunking. This is I also didn't understand. Does this mean uh, Matt and Perrin get their own room? Yeah, so that was another one that I was wondering if you would just let slide or not. I should not. <laughs> Yeah, um, but but yeah so it's, it's like, wait a second, if three people can be in a room, why don't you get three boys in a room, right? <laughs> yeah, but I guess we maybe, and I don't even, it doesn't even seem important for the rest of this scene necessarily, but maybe in the next chapter, there's some reason to have him in the same room with Landon Tom. Uh, 
But anyway, minor thing, because they both go, Tom's going to go tell us stories. Mm -hmm. Rand's like, I've already heard all those stupid stories. I'm done with this guy, which is the correct attitude. And then, um, (laughs) oh, so this is almost hidden by the, the layout of the book. But I highlighted the end of this and the beginning of this because I think this is the first time there is a break inside a chapter in Uh, in the whole thing. Yeah, Yeah, there should be like a blank space there There because there's not symbols or something. It's just meant to be a space. Yeah, this is the first time that happens uh, at all, period, as far as I I know of what I've read so far. So that that was kind of interesting, like not making this a separate chapter, not making this the beginning of the next right. chapter or something. Um, just right, putting right. like a hard break there to give us dream sequence number three. <laughs> I mean, if you call that last one a dream sequence, which is a, a bit of a stretch, but I'm gonna I'm gonna count it. <laughs> All right, a so dream flash, a dream moment, a dream, yeah, a dream, a dream moment. Oh, that's nice. Um, so Jeff, you were, uh, you were, you said you kind of knew how I was going to feel about yeah. this one. Um, yes. I want to see how well you know me, like, like we're on like some weird, like dating show or something. I want, I want you to tell me why Perfect. I was more okay with this dream sequence than uh, dream sequence number one. Completely. Um, so this, this does tie back to what I was saying about sort of three different types of dream sequences to a degree, Mm. where the first dream sequence that is Steve's least favorite chapter um, doesn't seem to really have anything to do with the story, right? It just, it it doesn't feel like we're progressing the narrative Mm -hmm. beyond maybe getting glimpses of things like, you know, Steve doesn't care about that. Mm -hmm. Um, But here, here, it's like we're getting to meet the big bats. Mm. Uh, And so it's a cheat, right? Like it's, if, he was writing from multiple viewpoints, we could be getting chapters just from the bad guy's view, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but because this is limited to Rand's viewpoint, this is a way that we are getting the two, you know, protagonists and antagonists up against each other yeah. here. Um, and so that, I, I would think, would, would be okay. Now, you might prefer it to happen in a different way than the dream sequence, um, and maybe the lead-in took too long, um, but I think you'd be okay with uh, the bad guy being revealed and talked to. Right, right. Basically. This is a scene. This is mm-hmm. not like a random dream sequence where I'm just seeing a bunch of imagery. This is this is two right. people talking to each other. Kind of more of a one-sided conversation, to be sure. But this is sure. a scene sure. between two characters. So, like, I didn't feel like this really... Th- this could have might as well have been a long distance phone call, basically. Sure. You know, that he's right. just like, oh, I'm going to dial you up and I'm going to uh say intimidating scary things to you uh and so like yeah i i I like this a lot more i was a lot more engaged with this because it it is just a conversation and we're seeing you know our big bad guy again for the first time um since the beginning i do think i'm gonna guess that you're still annoyed by the ambiguity of knowing exactly who he is of like is he the guy that we saw in the prologue and Lol, Maybe if he is Lol. not, then I just I just super assumed it. I just hyper assumed that, that this is that dude. If this is not that dude, then I will be annoyed. <laughs> now, I don't know. He said his name in the prologue, and it wasn't this. Right. right. It was something. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't this. So if, the, if this is a different dude, what? Really? Because they're in the, the Melted Walls castle. Um, right, here. so so here's the thing, though. Notice how Rand says right after that, the dark one. Uh-huh. So this isn't supposed to so much be a dude as the dark one. Yeah, but it's just a just a dude in 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 black clothes. And sure, well, his eyes go all weird, and I definitely didn't see that, you know, with the other dude. Wait, wh- where's the description? A man stood in front of the fireplace. Um, he had not noticed the man when he came in. So this makes me think like, okay, cause that dude teleports in just like he did in the prologue, um, dressed in dark clothes of a fine cut seemed to be in the prime of his maturity. <laughs> I, I don't know if that matches up with the description like that. He's, that he's, uh, you know, he's the silver Fox, uh, this dude, um, <laughs> supposed women would find good looking. 
I like that line too. Like, I, I don't know if men are attractive, but uh, I suppose this guy's attractive. Uh, but all of that and the fact that we're in the same castle with all the melty walls and the people melted into the walls and all that is just so leading me by the nose to believe this was the man in black that I saw before. And I'm guessing now from your comments, this is not. This is the Dark One, capital <laughs> T, the Dark One. But, like, what? why not? Why isn't it the dude that I saw before? I can't answer that. <laughs> but I can tell you that this is now the second time we've met someone that we might think is that dude, right? Yeah, right. And this one, I'm not, I mean... I think if you're using the glossary some uh, um, or looking back, then you would know. I, that's I should I said, have looked Dave. this dude up, I guess. Bal- yeah, if, you look, if you look the old mod up, yeah, okay, you'll see what okay, it says. Okay. But I'm not sure because in the back it talks about it's the Trolloc name for the Dark One, mm-hmm. but you could think maybe Trolloc just call that dude the Dark One. Right. So that that's why I, I started with this. Like we don't do, we don't really know. Like right. is he the same guy as right. before, or is he a different dude? And I thought that ambiguity might annoy you. And so I think more it's now that you're discovering that maybe it's not. That it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, just how many men in black do we need here in this place? Oh, you got to keep that. <laughs> I, I get that, like, black is, like, a, a bad guy color that, like, everybody's going to wear black. But, like, I don't know. You, you, but that's just like the descriptor for every maybe this could dark one be more decked out or something or i i don't know like you could do something that he's he's got flaming eyes bro he's, he's got flaming eyes. eyes right yeah uh maybe that's another well, that's another thing i like about star wars like darth vader is the only bad guy who just wears black he's like him him and the yeah. emperor and they're and they're yeah, set the other people wearing their little suits, but he's the only one that wears shiny black. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so I like this. I like this scene. Now, here's my question about oh, this. So again, this is really signposting to me. It might be a total fake out, and if it is, kudos. But really signposting to me that Rand is the true dragon reborn or whatever, um, because mm-hmm. he's having this vision, this flash of being in the same castle um, where this guy was. I guess what my question is, is this makes me feel like Dark One knows that Rand is the one that he's looking for. Like, if he knows, like, okay, I'm going to dial into your dream. Like, does he know who he's talking to? I, you know, I think he does. And if he knew, knows that Rand is the one he's looking for, then he could have really tightened his search here. Uh, unless he had no idea, like, where Rand would have been um in this but this just seems like way more targeted or are like all boys who are exactly the same as <laughs> just Rand having this like little visit right now from well, the dark he, one Belzaman does say are you the one mm-hmm. you cannot hide it from me forever okay so we, we do get this indication that yeah he, he's just yeah, every every boy this age is just having this dream um, no, I, mean, I don't know if it's exactly <laughs> like this, but we do get the indication that uh, Balesman thinks it might be him, mm. uh, but is, is not sure. Right. Um, but that does lead me into what I, I thought you might think about or maybe dislike in this, which is, uh, you know, what's what's Balesman's goal with this? Like, if he knows that Rand is in, why isn't he just killing him? Or, mm. like, why does he talk to him at all? So I, I was wondering if uh, those would be the things you were curious about with this one. Yeah, are you the one? You cannot hide it from yeah. me forever. Cannot hide it. You cannot even hide yourself from me. Right. I mean, you haven't found him so far, bro. I know you down to the smallest hair. So, but you don't the, know, like, like if he's the one. Like this guy's just BSing. Come on, well, so, <laughs> Balsamon. Come on. I, I was gonna say, does that then create a, a question of you know unreliability in this? this right. Background? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I dug this cause it was a, it was a fun scene and they have some back and forth. Um, and he cool. just, the bad guy flexes a little and, uh, that's right. cool. I'm glad you, uh, went back and found the line so we can kind of show the, the part that could make us question the reliability of this person, which I think kind of legitimizes this scene, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we're not sure how 
uh, much this bad guy really knows or can do, mm-hmm. it can make more sense why he is sort of, as you say, just flexing in the scene and not doing more because can he, or can he, he says he can, but can he, right? You know, so. right. Um, yeah, cool. So I'm, I'm digging it again. This just kind of makes me, you know, he's not doing a good real, uh, pitch, good pitch here either. Like kind of being like, Oh, the I said, I are going to use you up. I mean, dude, you're a scary dude with fire in your eyes. Of course, I'm going to go with the Aes Sedai <laughs> over you, buddy. Like, what are you talking about? You're not going to, like, drive me against them. And so the Red's like, do I have any choice but to trust her? After this, I would say absolutely not. You have to trust her because your alternate is, like, this creepy dude. Yeah, I, we really don't get another one that he can do. Well, I mean, he says you'll serve me, right? So I guess it is... You know, mm. serve him instead. Is he making is he making it sound better? It's not like he's really offering power, right? Yeah. So yeah, that is uh, something I, I was also actually curious about with you. We've kind of talked back and forth about you know should Rand be trusting Moraine? Do we trust Moraine? Do we trust Aes Sedai? Right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, this chapter is meant to make Rand question it because. He's hearing this information from the bad guy, right? And that even happens at the end, right? So do you have any choice but to trust her and I to die? It was as bad as the dreams thinking about it. So, you know, we're definitely getting Jordan one, selling us on this idea that Rand doesn't know if he should trust the Aes Sedai. Um, but I, in this rereading, kind of going back through it, it, it does seem a little hard to feel that question the same amount that Rand seems to be feeling that mm-hmm. question. As, yeah, Moraine's scary, but but not like this. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just saying I sort of feel what you've brought up before about this sort of back and forth that is being leaned on again in this part. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, so Steve prediction. What prediction am I up to now? Up to number five. <laughs> My prediction is, Rand is a dragon reborn. He's gonna f everything up by grabbing the sword accidentally in the <laughs> in the tear. Um, and then he's going to go insane and basically like be the bad guy then. Um, and then like our other heroes are going to have to deal with that. Or maybe that's even the cliffhanger for the end of this book. Is that like, oh, this yeah. This book will yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So cool. I'll put that on the record. That one's a really, I'm... that one's a reach. That one I do. I, I would say my probability of being correct on that is like, five percent or something i'll put it really low but i have some reactions to that one and we will revisit those at the end of the all right all right i was just gonna say uh one last thing here does this part with the question of him not knowing if it's Rand? does this make you wonder if like matt and perrin are having the same dream yeah i mean that's what i wondered so like yeah and now if they like wake up the next morning and they're all like oh yeah we all had the same dream then i'll be like okay so he doesn't know it's Rand, but it doesn't shake my belief that he's Rand since Rand is my main character. Sure, sure. Right. I, I just wonder if you were like, you know, waiting for that to be in or like I'm eager to find out yeah. if this. Because the reason I ask that sort of stuff is obviously certain points for why you would keep reading aren't there for you as a reader. But I'm wondering like which points are, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I cool. guess we'll find out how they're going to mess everything up in the city uh, next week. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next time. We'll see you then, everyone.